Hi, I'm Alex Bowers, and in my talk today, I'll be talking about K-12 early warning systems and decision making in education, considering issues of algorithmic accuracy and openness. So I'm a faculty member at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City, and I'll be talking today about these early warning system issues, especially for predicting uh, at risk using machine learning uh, for students dropping out of K-12 education uh, in primary and secondary school. Um, especially with a focus on the United States, but overall across the globe. But before I get started, I would like to acknowledge uh, the generous uh, funding from multiple different organizations, including the National Science Foundation, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Northeast Big Data Hub, and the Robertson Foundation. So the problem I'd like to address today is first an issue of data and evidence use in schools. So currently data analytics dashboards and predictive analytics systems are used across modern K-12 education systems. And early warning systems, EWS is how I'll refer to it in this presentation, and early warning ind indicators, EWIs, uh, predict student at-risk status uh, as far as um, our prediction of how they're going to do semester by semester on overall outcomes, as well as um, total schooling outcomes, such as graduating, dropping out, going to university and uh, college going post-secondary education. The problem, however, is that many domains of AI and education have been applied to early warning prediction in education, such as machine learning, learning analytics, education data mining. Yet, while there have been many advances in machine learning across multiple industries over the last decade, current algorithmic applications in K-12 early warning systems lack generalizability, accuracy, and use in practice by school leaders and educators. So the core of what I'll be talking about today is all part of a uh, paper that I have coming out um, in a uh, uh, report by the OECD. It's a, a edited report. And so I've just, this is just one chapter in and, and the larger report. And it's titled Early Warning Systems and Indicators of Dropping Out of Upper Secondary School, the Emerging Role of Digital Technologies. And by the time this video is posted, uh, this should either be uh, out in, um, early uh, spring of 2021 or just after. And so the issue is across schooling, there's many different types of data dashboards and data use systems that educators and school leaders can use. Here's just three, including Panorama, Education, Infinite Campus, and Illuminate where these companies want to display the information back to a school about individual students or um, their overall schooling processes and their data to help enhance and support decision-making by school leaders. The issue though, is that across the current research, educators have been shown to rarely access these dashboards. So in a recent paper um, in, uh, that just came out 2021 uh, by Farley Ripple and colleagues, using the very popular in the United States NWEA map data dashboards and examining log files across 20 schools across five districts, they state, we observed that overall engagement with the system was fairly infrequent. In general, educators logged on to each report only a few times per year and utilized only a few of the reports available. Then also, here's a, a really interesting paper from 2017 from Wayman, Sean Cho. And they had one school district, 65,000 students, 670 teachers across 73 schools. And they showed very little relationship between what they term instructional clicks. So they went through every single log file uh, in the data warehouse and coded every click for whether or not it was instruction or uh, related or not. So like non-instruction would be like discipline or attendance. And so they showed the very weak relationship with elementary reading and no relationships with how often educators clicked with elementary or junior high mathematics or junior high reading over three years. And then recent research has also shown that uh, using um, randomized controlled experiments Early warning system dashboards have, have, have been shown to have no effect so far for a variety of reasons. And here's uh, two examples, uh, 2017 and uh, 2019. Um, but so far, the research evidence is, is fairly weak on the idea that these data use dashboards and the early warning systems are being put to use across multiple different schooling systems. And on top of that, when it comes to machine learning, this recent report 
demonstrated that the models across individual school districts in the United States were not generalizable. The authors note that we must reanalyze using uh, the machine learning algorithms again on different data sets every time. As they say, in short, the best indicators of failure to graduate on time for one district in grade level may not be the best for other districts in grade levels. So these issues then for predictive analytics and early warning systems in K-12 education, early warning systems and indicators these randomized controlled trials have to date shown little effect on student persistence. Admittedly though, the evidence is sparse. These are early randomized controlled experiments. There'll be many more to come. Early evidence suggests that machine learning prediction algorithms may not generalize well across contexts. So running your uh, data mining and fitting your model in one district or system doesn't really mean that it's gonna generalize to a different one. To date, interventions that target K-12 persistence don't show much impact as shown in a very nice um, review uh, by Freeman and Simonson. And so in the end, what does a data analyst in education do? So I've put forward this idea of education leadership data analytics in which we bring together the three domains of education leadership in which it's all about how to help uh, support school leaders in their decision-making using evidence-based improvement cycles in which school leaders aren't telling teachers what to do and they're not even telling them what data to look at. It's the school leader's um, job to point out where issues may be happening using the data and to highlight areas. But then their work becomes the work of collaboration and building a collaborative context and a collaborative team in their school around evidence-based improvement cycles to be able to use the data in the school to help us facilitate and understand where our issues are together, have the teachers decide where's the issue and what they're going to do about it next. But also I've brought in these areas of data science and data analytics, which includes machine learning um, and AI and education with this idea that the new domains that have uh, arisen over the last 10 to 20 years and what we can do with machine learning and data science really can help inform these two other circles of educational leadership and evidence-based improvement cycles. To, as uh, this piece from uh, about 10 years uh, made the point, make visible data that have heretofore gone unseen, unnoticed, and therefore unactionable. So in 2019, uh, myself and my colleagues had a white paper report that we published from a summit where we brought together uh, researchers and education leaders from across the domain, uh, including um, uh, the researchers who are working at these interfaces of school leadership, evidence-based improvement cycle, cycles, and machine learning, and published a white paper report from over that it included the responses from over 100 people who attended this summit. And we got them together to begin to understand this idea of what is education leadership data analytics and where can it go? And the definition that we came to um, as a group was education leadership data analytics practitioners work collaboratively with schooling system leaders and teachers to analyze pattern and visualize previously unknown patterns and information from the vast sets of data collected by schooling organizations, and then integrate findings in easy to understand language and digital tools into collaborative and community building evidence-based improvement cycles with stakeholders. So sure, it's a run-on sentence, but it captures these issues of being able to bring together these digital tools to help inform decision-making with collaboration with the stakeholders. And so we identified a range of needs and challenges in the field, which includes collaborative partnerships with schooling organizations. So more information and more of a, a centralized role for educators in all of these conversations. Capacity building and training infrastructure. Focus on equity and algorithmic fairness. Data privacy and security. And open and accessible data and tools using fair data standards. Fair uh, meaning... Uh, findable, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. We also laid out a roadmap in this report of what it could look like to build skills and uh, competencies across this area. Um, thinking first about what are the different roles around data use? 
So practicing administrators, quantitative analysts, research specialists, and educational data scientists. Uh, and so this includes areas of leadership and community building, data-driven decision-making program evaluation, as well as issues of uh, thinking about data science, data ethics and data management, e-administration, thinking through learning management systems, some coding and UX and dashboard design, as well as education, data mining, descriptive, descriptive statistics, learning analytics, um, and uh, our talk, uh, what we're talking about today, this issue around early warning systems, and then evidence-based improvement cycles, and ideas around school psychometrics as well. So, in also thinking about these issues, I had a piece uh, with Tommaso Agnostisti, a, a colleague in Milan, in Italy, and in this piece uh, a, a few years ago in 2017, where we worked through these issues of thinking about data analytics and decision making, and thinking about the role of the educational data science as a key actor in schools and higher education institutions. And in this piece, we really talk through the difference between educational data mining, learning analytics, and academic analytics, relying a lot on the learning analytics and education data mining research that came before us. But one of the things we really talked about in this piece was that in this data analytics model for education, where it begins with collection and acquisition of data, storage of data, cleaning of data sets, integration of uh, the, the different types of data sets together, analysis, representation, visualization, action. This is the danger zone that I really want to point out when it comes to analysis ethics. So potential recommendations or decisions with algorithms happen in this area between analysis, representation, visualization, and action. And as we say in this piece, if there is a machine learning algorithm that makes a decision on a student or a recommendation on a student, that code must be open access. The taxpayers paid for it, so it must be open and auditable by the public. If it's not, it's unethical. And that's the stance that we take in this piece. So I wanna shift a little to move to this idea of where we are with education early warning indicators and early warning systems, talking specifically about dropout risk and thinking about using education early warning indicators to drive decisions and make targeted and data-informed resource allocation decisions to improve schooling outcomes. So in this work uh, was supported by uh, multiple graduate students over uh, many years, uh, including Ryan Spratt, Sherry Taff, and Xiao Lang Zhang. So first I wanna talk about a piece that we had come out um, almost about a decade ago now, um, thinking about issues of accuracy and predicting high school dropout. And then I'm gonna build on where that research has gone. So first, we know the dropping out of high school, especially with the research in the United States, is associated with a multitude of negative life outcomes. Um, so, however, other than a select number of demographic and background variables, we know little about the accuracy of current dropout predictors that are school related. Current predictions accurately predict only about 50 to 60% of students who actually drop out. And according to Gleason Diodarski now from 20 years ago, accurate prediction of who will drop out is a resource and efficiency issue. A large percentage of students are misidentified as at risk if it's only, if your prediction is only 50 to 60%. So you're missing a lot, half of the students who would have dropped out. And then a large percentage of students you're missing who are at risk, who were never identified and they're never provided any resources to help them. Current, uh, before this paper that I'll talk about from 2012, current reporting of dropout flags across the literature was haphazard. Almost none reported accuracy. Many reported sensitivity uh, or specificity, but rarely both. And the point is, a dropout flag may be highly precise in that almost all the students with the flag drop out, but may not be accurate since the flag may identify only a small proportions of the dropouts. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So for the paper that um, I'm, I'm overviewing here, uh, what we did was we first reanalyzed past dropout flags for accuracy, precision, sensitivity, and specificity. So we looked at all studies that had a dropout predictor from 1979 to uh, 2011, I believe it was, um, examined high school dropout and looked at school-wide characteristics that included all students focusing on the student level, and studies had to report frequencies for reanalysis. We had over 6,000 studies, 301 we ended up reading in full, 140 provided their samples, but only 36 articles at the time provided enough data for accuracy recalculations. But that yielded 110 separate dropout flags, 
which we then converted into relative operating characteristics. So the ROC or the ROC uh, uh, statistic, which is hits versus false alarms. So how a ROC statistic works is it's very similar to a type one or type two error in statistics. So we use a, an event versus predictor table like this, where uh, if uh, you predict that a student drops out and they do drop out, well, then that's a true positive and you're, and you're correct. And if you predict that they graduate and they, and they do graduate, then that's, that's, that's a true negative, that, that you're correct as well. But if you predict that they drop out, but they actually graduate, that's a false positive, and it's very similar to a type one error. And if you predict that they graduate, but they actually drop out, that's a false negative. And um, that's the equivalent to a type two error. And with just a, a little bit of math, we can get to what's called sensitivity, which I would call the hits versus one minus specificity, the false positive proportion, which is the false alarms. And the way to visualize this is to put those two numbers onto an XY coordinate plane. And so here we've got the false positive proportion, this one minus specificity, going back a slide, one minus specificity is false alarms. And then on the Y axis, true positive proportion, the sensitivity, the hits. And so in a rock plot, the 45 degree line is a random guess. Anything closer to 0 0.01 is a perfect prediction. So we want predictors to get closer and closer to that zero one point. And here I plot uh, from um, about 15 years ago now, uh, Balfonts et al piece, where they had a very robust data set from uh, the city of Philadelphia in the United States, looking over many, many years. And they used Boolean operators to combine multiple different flags, such as failed math, failed English, low attendance, uh, whether or not a student was suspended, unsatisfactory behavior. And then they uh, put them together. So one or more flags, any one flag, these kinds of things. And you can see when we replotted these using the rock plot, as, they, as the Balfont's uh, paper says, they were able to accurately find and identify about 60%, 0.6, of the students with the, their one or more flags predictor. But the issue here with the rock plot that now we can see is that they also misidentified a little over 30% of the students who would have graduated. And so this is the issue. So we had 110 dropout predictors and we plotted them um, based on, uh, so this is 110 numbers and the numbers go in order uh, by author last name. So the number one is gonna be in the A's and the number uh, 110 is gonna be in the Z's. So as you can see, most of the predictors at the time, and so this was a 2013 paper, most of the predictors at the time clustered down at the bottom left, which meant that they were really quite specific, but not very sensitive, which means they didn't capture the majority of students who do drop out. And just as a point of reference, this number nine here is the Balfonts paper, with Balfonts being B. Um, that's the num that's their best predictor. So you can see it's 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 a pretty good predictor overall, as we want predictors to go towards that zero one upper left corner. Now, the question becomes, <clears throat> what happens if we apply now machine learning in these situations? So there's a great paper a couple of years ago, now uh, 2015, by Jared Knowles, who at the time worked for the Wisconsin Department of Education. And he had this piece uh, published in the Journal of Education Data Mining, where he used all, he had all the data from all the students in uh, Wisconsin, and he applied machine learning to this idea, but he replotted the rock plot, showing here the, uh, where the Balfonts indicators were, as well as the plus signs are the Chicago on track indicator. So in Chicago, which this, the Chicago on track indicator is whether or not a student uh, has failed a core course such as uh, mathematics or English um, or is behind on credits. And this, uh, the Chicago on track indicator has been uh, used in many, many places. Um, and as far as an early warning indicator, and uh, has been attributed in Chicago to uh, quite a bit of the success as just one component of their early warning system to help motivate conversations around with educators about how to help these students. And so what Knowles did here is he wanted to compare and say, uh, could he have a better accuracy or, or be able to capture more students with uh, machine learned predictors uh, than these uh, individual predictors? And so 
what we do here with a, uh, the rock plot, we can have a, what's called a, the AUC. So the AUC is the area under the curve when we actually plot the continuous predictor um, over this plot. And you can see across each of the Knowles uh, models tested using all the data that he had in Wisconsin, he was not able to beat the Chicago on track indicator. And so this was really quite interesting with this idea that even using these machine learned models, there was a lot of variance in the accuracy of being able to predict um, each of these, uh, the, the accuracy of, of these types of early warning indicators, trying to predict whether or not a student is going to drop out given the data at hand in the system. Recent research has replicated the, this uh, Knowles's research with um, uh, the rock AUCs, the area under the curves, around 0.75 to 0.8. So Sansoni 2019 uh, had a sample of 21,000 students, a national sample from the United States. He had 1,700 features in his machine learning um, uh, 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 process. Uh, and his AUCs were between 0.77 to 0.8. Uh, so he had a support vector machine, a lasso, a boosted regression. Um, and he was able to show that ninth grade GPA was most predictive out of, out of the models. Goldhaber uh, 2020, they had over a million students from across multiple states in the United States. And all they used pretty much was third grade um, uh, math and English scores. And they did pretty well actually with uh, AUCs of uh, uh, 0.75-ish. Um, and then Ryan Baker's group uh, had a, a really great paper um, in uh, 2020 where they used a single school district from, tech, from the United States in Texas, had about 15,000 students in AUC about 0.76, uh, and they used um, grade nine, uh, about 231 different features. So the issue then is that machine learning has gotten us a long way so that we can get more accurate predictors. But the problem is, what are these? There's these predictors that are above the AUC line. And when I set out to make the original plot um, in 2013, I did not plan this, but that predictor ends up being one of my predictors. And this is from a paper in 2012, where we had a growth mixture model using a national sample of United States student, students, where we simultaneously estimated the trajectories of students through their non-cumulative GPAs from ninth grade semester one, ninth grade semester two, and 10th grade semester one. So a non-cumulative GPA would be not a GPA uh, added up over time and averaged over time, but the grade point average for one semester and then you calculate that, and then you calculate the grade point average for another semester and do not add them together. And what, we, what that provides us is the ability to see trajectories over time. And so the number one um, per, uh, uh, outcome from the study is for schools to really begin looking at non-cumulative GPA as a really useful data point. Um, rather than accumulating GPA over the life course of a student. But what a growth mixture model does is that it asks, is there a mixture of trajectories here? And do we have significantly different trajectories of maybe students going up, maybe a completely different type of trajectory of students going down, maybe down and up, looking at this over time and then predicting whether or not the students drop out. So I had about 5,400 students in this data set, and here I plotted them all. And the algorithm identified four significantly different groups of student trajectories. On the left, uh, from ninth grade semester one through 10th grade semester two, these students are about 10.8% of the, of the sample. And they have kind of grades that are kind of in the middle and they're going down slowly. The low increasing, they're 13.8%. They're um, going, their grades are going up, but fairly slowly over time in general. The mid achieving are fairly high. They're the vast majority of students. Then the high achieving, they're almost 20% of the students and, and they're uh, doing, uh, they've got very high grades throughout the time. But the point of the algorithm and the point of the study is that while the first two groups, the mid decreasing and the low increasing make up about a quarter of the sample, 25% of the sample, they make up over 91% of all the dropouts using just the data from the schools that schools already collect on these students, data that the, is already reported to the students, non-cumulative GPA in each of these semesters, we were able to identify almost all of the dropouts. And on top of that, we're able to show the difference in two very different types of dropouts in which when we actually, the, 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 the data set includes surveys of the students and how they were feeling about school, 
So we were able to say for the mid-decreasing students, while they're only 40% of the dropouts, they're much more like the traditional type of uh, what, what uh, the research would say is the, the, the students who are, who are struggling with the point of schooling itself. They don't think schooling is there for them. Um, they don't think their teachers like them and they don't really like school. So we suggest in this paper, based on this uh, data set and this finding, that these students would need um, a better connection with school as far as an intervention, where the low increasing students, they're the majority of the students who drop out. And what we say here is that these students, their grades are going up, but not fast enough. And when they're surveyed, they say they like school. They're, they like their teachers, their friends are at school. So these students need academic tutoring. And so here we can see what this type of algorithm is able to show us when we look at the data over time. And so, and you might be asking yourself, aren't grades a problematic data set? Well, no, um, I now have all, uh, well over uh, a decade's worth of research showing that grades uh, and standardized test scores are two very different types of assessments. But the issue that comes up with grades is that they correlate with test scores uh, at 0.5, which means if you square that correlation, then 25% of grades is whatever standardized test scores are. But the other 75% of grades are the how are what teachers value as far as what I've called um, the uh, uh, social the how students negotiate the social processing of schooling itself. And so it measures engaged participation in very strong ways. And when a student has figured out how to engage and participate in um, the institution of schooling, then that's highly predictive of students being able to do that in um, secondary school um, and then uh, post-secondary school, as well as then the workforce and job. So coming back to the rock plot, it's the, the, what we were able to show is, quite, is that there's quite a distribution but that when talking to, to educators and education data analysts, they wanted more information on how to do this themselves, especially given the research that's come before uh, that I talked about at the very beginning of this talk that really has shown that we need to rerun our machine learning algorithms in each context in each school district. So Xiaoling Zhou and, and I had a paper out um, in 2019 where we show how to do the ROC uh, AUC uh, code how to uh, run the analysis. And we use public data set from the National Center for Education Statistics here in the United States and publish the R markdown so that anyone can, any data scientist, uh, data analyst can uh, learn how to do this and replicate it themselves. Um, and so, and we showed a bunch of different uh, outcomes uh, and uh, just kind of uh, showed how it could work with some exemplars. So here's uh, rock plots for what predicts um, college enrollment, as well as post-secondary STEM degree. So and and the types of um, uh, variables that you can run to see what you uh, would show as the most accurate predictors. We also uh, give, um, uh, as does Jared Knowles, uh, links and code for uh, the PROC package in R, which also allows you to statistically significantly compare uh, which uh, rock curve is more accurate than another one, which is really quite useful. And so to sum up and to begin to wrap up, I really wanted uh, to, to talk about this comparing the different identification uh, strategies for education, early warning systems and early warning indicators across this domain. So I've had some work, but I also showed at the beginning that there, there's many other uh, research papers out there. And the way I see how these different predictors are distributed across the domain is here on the x-axis, I'm trying to think about the role of theory in predictor uh, selection, whether or not theory is low um, versus high. And on the y-axis for a model, whether or not the model is fairly simple or more complex. And so if we plot these different methods on the lower left, I think the logistic regression studies, um, and there's been quite a few, most of the papers in the, the rock plot paper that I showed from 2013 were logistic regression studies. And 
I see them as having fairly low theory because people use pretty much the data that's at hand. I mean, they're overall fairly um, uh, simple as far as the model, logistic re re regression model. Whereas if we go along at the bottom of the, the, the uh, along the x-axis at the bottom of the y-axis, individual variable dropout flags, theory is a little higher. So we're choosing a variable based on theory, but it's only just one variable. So it's not very complex at all. It's the most simple model. Um, and the Chicago on track model is just a few variables um, uh, put together. And so, but high theory, thinking about the life course of the student, really thinking about where uh, theory is positioned and how uh, we use theory to select the different indicators. But then as we go up the y-axis, begin thinking about much more complex uh, algorithms uh, using machine learning, regression trees, random forests, neural networks. The role of theory is very low here. Whereas uh, the model gets pretty complex, but we're using all of the variables and all of the features that are available to us. So you might have more than a thousand fe features like I showed uh, earlier from some of the uh, other comparative research. And then um, growth mixture models I would put over here where the theory is really high. We knew that going in that grades uh, were quite predictive for, for very specific theoretical reasons on this engaged participation piece. And the model is very complex because it's a growth mixture model. So it uses longitudinal um, uh, data. And really growth mixture models kind of sit between data mining and inferential statistics. There is an EM algorithm, um, kind of a gradient uh, uh, finding um, algorithm to the whole thing. So to think about these, I really think this x-axis might be going between data mining and a priori hypotheses. And it's not what, that one is good or bad, it's just that they're, they're different and they get us to different places. And in thinking about how to, how, to, how to bring these things together, what I've talked about today is if we look, look at bottom left, clarity of action, clarity of model and model accuracy. So really I think in the, this bottom left quadrant, clarity of action might be low uh, because we just chose uh, variables based on what's available or all just look at every single feature. So uh, a machine learning model might not show us exactly what to do, especially like a neural network. Um, it's where we might not know exactly how it came to the, its decisions. It's, it's difficult to know what to do, but we know that maybe the student might be predicted as being very high at risk, but exactly what to do next is an issue. Clarity of model, especially when it comes to uh, the complexity of the model with machine learning, Clarity of the model is very low. Um, and then model accuracy, maybe down here in the bottom left is fairly low, but I didn't put accuracy on here as a, as a uh, axis because I, I'm, it's, I think it's an open question. But if we go to the right in this bottom right quadrant with the individual variable dropout flags and the Chicago on track indicator, clarity of action is really high. We, we know where to intervene. Uh, so for, again, the Chicago on track indicator, students are failing a core subject or they're behind on credit. So let's help them not fail subjects, do, do well in the, in the tutoring um, and uh, catch them up on their credits that they're behind. So what we, what we know to do is high. The clarity of the model is high. You know how it made the decision. The model accuracy is okay. I, maybe it's not low. Maybe it should be uh, classified more as medium. Then we go to the upper left with machine learning, where a model, um, the theory is low, but complexity of the model is high. Clarity of action is low. In a neural network, you don't, how will we know um, either what to do or how the model made its decision? But you can get really well fit models. Um, so the model accuracy can be super high. And maybe it's a little overfit. And then in this upper right, clarity of action is high. So with the growth mixture model of non cumulative GPA findings, like I said, we were able to identify two different groups because we were able to show a typology because it's a growth mixture model. Um, and the mixture is the typology that there's statistically significant different patterns of responders in the data set. And so what to do is very clear uh, for the students. Clarity of the model, exactly how it works, unclear. Uh, it is, uh, it's a fairly complex model. Um, and how to, to generate it and replicate it is uh, not the easiest thing to explain. Um, but the model accuracy is very high and higher than current machine learning. Um, and so I've come to this conclusion 
and it may or may not be wrong, but maybe here between clarity of action, clarity of model and clarity of accuracy, maybe it's very similar to the age old adage of good, fast, cheap, pick any two. Maybe it's action, model, accuracy, pick any two. So if we have clarity of action and model accuracy, it seems that the research literature to date is saying that the models are not very generalizable between different contexts. So we know what to do um, and the model is highly accurate, but the, the, as I started out by saying, we need to rerun those uh, machine learning algorithms in each school district. If clarity of action and clarity of model, but then maybe we have low accuracy. Um, so it's super simple. Uh, we know what to do and we picked a couple variables, but the uh, model accuracy isn't, isn't very high because that's how we got to the finding. It's, it's down here in the bottom right. But then clarity of model and clarity of accuracy. Okay, but then we, that's, that's where a lot of the machine learned uh, 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 models are right now. But what's the action? How do we know what to do? And I called it low quality because these kinds of models are very uh, easy to actually build um, if you use demographic indicators um, uh, that are outside the control of the school or the, or the students, uh, which I find highly problematic. I could have labeled this bias. Um, and uh, I find that if there's not a clarity of action, you're not providing um, the students and the community um, a strong ability to be able to take their own action given the data. Uh, using demographic indicators um, is highly problematic because the, the students have no control over that and it's, and it's impossible um, usually to intervene um, because uh, that's not what the, 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 what we're able to do in schools. So I don't know, this may be uh, something that uh, maybe it's pick any two, maybe here I put a question mark at the center, maybe there are models um, that can do it and I'm uh, uh, to do all three and do it well. And I'm very excited to see the next 10 years of research really begin to focus on the center of this, of this Venn diagram. And so just again, to remind everyone as I wrap up that there, uh, there's, there'll be this paper uh, that will be out uh, soon here in spring of 2021 with the OECD and the link is at the bottom of the slide. Um, and you can also uh, Google uh, when it comes out, uh, uh, Google for it, there's a, a webpage um, that's uh, there with uh, current information on the project. And so just to finish up, in that chapter, one of the things I say, I, uh, this is a figure I've created for that chapter. I adapted it from a Google engineering report um, from 2015. But the whole idea is that how do we see an education early warning system? Well, predictor and identification, what we've been talking about today is right here in the middle, but it's the smallest part of the entire process. Where in an early warning uh, system, we have student actions and performance, the school community uh, and the, the community itself and time, these are all very important pieces. But then as data analysts and as the system designers, the data has to be clean and verified and uh, managed into a database. And data management is one of the hardest pieces of the job. And then we need student family and teacher feedback that then moves through the, the predictor identification to early warning indicators in this entire early warning system. This makes inferences about student, cha student challenges with school that feeds into a data dashboard in which we would hope that we could tailor interventions and offer supports, create resources, and then monitor and assess feedback, which then goes back through the entire system. And so in this, in this paper, I also come to the conclusion that, and I propose that there should be these four A's of early warning indicators. So these are my, the, the, this is my proposal. And I'm hopeful that this is helpful to people working on algorithms, AI in education, early warning systems, in that the, these early warning indicators and these algorithms should be accurate, accessible, actionable, and accountable. So that's the four A's. So accurate in that they should have a high rock AUC, so high accuracy in comparison to benchmarks. And studies must plot previous benchmarks in comparison to the new to show that the new indicator has higher accuracy. But then that model needs to be accessible, easy to understand and open to investigation. As I said earlier with the 2017 piece that I mentioned at the beginning, that these algorithms need to be, if the taxpayer paid for them and an algorithm is gonna make a decision or a recommendation on a student, they must be open and accessible so that uh, the public can uh, audit them. So accurate and accessible, actionable, 
is that the predictor can be used to take action. So here, this is a quote from, the, from my paper. Actionable early warning indicators rely on predictors that are recent or real time, malleable, and under the influence of stakeholders in opposition to predictors that students, teachers, administrators, and family and community, community members have no control over. And then accountable. So these algorithms need to be regularly checked for bias, audited, which requires all the one, all the things above, and inspected in collaboration with the communities for which they are predicting, bringing the communities together in so that this, these algorithms are not being done to communities, but are being part of a collaborative system in which we include the stakeholders. And so just to wrap up and conclude with contributions and open questions, so for K-12 algorithms and early warning systems, there's a strong role for data science and machine learning in school leadership and decision-making through this idea of education leadership data analytics. Longitudinal non-cumulative GPA is a strong predictor of student outcomes. For early warning indicators, can we have it all or do we need to pick any two of clarity of action, clarity of model and model accuracy? Full alg algorithms should follow the four A's for early warning systems and early warning indicators for it to be accurate, accessible, actionable, and accountable. And early warning indicators and predictors are just a small part of a much larger system of stakeholders, students, educators, and the community. So thank you so much for listening to my talk. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me um, or contact me online. Thanks so much.